Now, Venezuela has undertaken a massive devaluation of its currency, slashing five zeros off banknotes as it attempts to ward off economic collapse. But who's to blame for this economic crisis? Venezuela had been championed as a shining example of socialism, but given current events, is it? And has socialism actually contributed to its decline? Well, I'm joined now by Guardian columnist Dawn Foster and Spiked Online deputy editor Tom Slater. Good morning to you both. Um, Dawn, it's been jaw-dropping to watch what has been happening to Venezuela. Uh, the IMF predicting that inflation was going to rise to a million percent by the end of this year. Is socialism to blame? I don't think socialism itself is to blame. I think the form of socialism that Maduro is currently pursuing could be to blame in Venezuela. I think that there are a lot of contributing factors and one of the biggest has, has been, you know, long-term, decades-long US interference across Latin America. I think that the US have always had a big problem with socialism emerging in Latin America, in Chile, in Venezuela, and this you know, the sanctions that the US impose make it very, very difficult for any economy to really function properly. And then at the same time, when you see people flee in Venezuela because of US intervention, the US, you know, don't accept the refugees. So I think the US have a lot, of, you know, should shoulder a lot of the blame here. But Maduro hasn't been acting as he should in the last few years. Tom, wh why is socialism such a dirty word to so many people? Well, I think socialism has just has become a bit of a dirty word because it becomes associated with things, often in times when it, well, it actually isn't. I mean, Venezuela is a really interesting example insofar as I don't think it necessarily is a socialist regime. It's what mm. Marxists used to call a Bonapartist regime, I think, in which you have a quite a small clique running the country um, and effectively trying to maintain um, some level of validity by engaging in some kind of crude redistribution. So they're under the guise of socialism. Exactly. And I, but I also think that in many ways the left's attempt to defend Venezuela over the years, or at least more recently, mm. attempts to kind of just shuffle their feet when, whether it's the issues with the currency, issues with human rights, um, issues with scarcity come up, um, actually only really feed that narrative. And I think the unfortunate thing for Venezuelans at the moment is that they have been caught for quite a long time in a kind of left-right culture war. The right always pointing to it is to show the evils and the terrible aspects of socialism. And the left often using it as a kind of as a place in which they have this kind of flicker of hope in an otherwise quite unsocialist world. And I think the people who get missed in that discussion are the Venezuelan people themselves who are really hurting at the moment. Yeah, 82% of the Venezuelan population are living in abject poverty. And we've seen scenes of people actually fleeing the country, mm. packing their suitcases, trying to get across the border to places like Ecuador. Because the stark reality is you need a wheelbarrow full of cash to go and buy a chicken. We've seen that image mm. enough over the last few days. And, you know, those images are damaging, particularly when they're um, portrayed under the banner of socialism. Yeah, completely. And I think what happens with socialism is that every time it goes wrong, people point to socialism. But whenever we have any issues within a capitalist state, nobody ever points there and says, this is a problem with capitalism. I mean, we've got abject poverty here for some people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the US has extreme poverty in some areas. But nobody points to that and says, this is, you know, this is because of capitalism, you know, more widely. So I think that there's a kind of double standard going on. You know, I agree with Tom that Venezuela isn't really acting in a socialist way, but it's, you know, it's used in that manner at the moment. And I think that actually the left do need to speak out when these sorts of things are, you know, uh, mooted under the guise of socialism. Mm. So, you know, at the moment, Venezuela is not going very well. And I think that people have been caught in the middle of this kind of culture war with the US mm -hmm. sanctions uh, making things worse. So the left need to speak up when it sees what could be described as faux socialism. Tom, give us an example of when socialism goes well, it goes right mm. in countries. Well, I think that's the big thing is that I think people on the left have always had that problem of there being no roadmap. But I think if anything, that just makes it more and more important that they don't go along with regimes just because they feel like it helps their side. And I also think in relation to Venezuela, what's been really um, crucial is not to blame all of this on US intervention. Now, it's not making matters any better, but if you think about the long-term problems with Venezuela in particular, effectively it's um, relying almost entirely on oil revenues and also not even it's investing in that industry. the economy, really, isn't it? Mm. It's what it boils down to. Completely, and that having incredibly low horizons for what the economy should be. I mean, it, about 95% of its exports at this point is in oil, and as soon as those prices plunge, something which they're not going to be in control, of then they of course at the behest of that so I think we can't let um, the Venezuelan government off the hook by just suggesting this is all just kind of um, 20th century style imperialism I think that's too simple yeah what does modern socialism look like in your eyes Dawn because we were talking about this earlier on on the program and Andy Walton the journalist here who was here talking about a paper review said you know look at the principles of the NHS that yeah. is built on socialism whenever there is a problem with the railways and people say 
we must take the railways back into government hands for it to run properly. That is a form of socialism. Yeah. I think in Britain we've got the NHS and I think that if you look at the kind of privatised rail system, as you said, that's a really bad example of what prison happens system with it. at the moment as well yeah, which is in the headlines completely. it's falling apart. I mean if you want a good example of socialism you just have to look across the water to uh, Sweden and Norway. Denmark um, as well. Yeah a lot of my friends there have you know kind of government sponsored childcare they're able to afford housing they have they're able to afford health care and women are able to work um, with with affordable childcare which we don't have here and whenever you go there the transport system you know mostly across Europe works brilliantly compared to our privatized system here so you know just look at Scandinavia it works very well there they're very very wealthy and you know they pay high taxes but equally they earn a lot of money Tom, why are we so reluctant to socialism then? Dawn's painted an incredible picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also think the thing is the whole debate about socialism get kind of vexed under terms. Because, for mm. instance, in the same way that we can say um, some of us might argue that Venezuela isn't a socialist state, again, if you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, it's a, a, a mix of a broadly kind of free market model mm. along with a lot of redistribution. I think that, if anything, I think the, especially the kind of internationalisation of a lot of these issues in relation to Venezuela or other places, I think speaks to the fact that a lot of the Western left have for a long time felt like revolution, like a <laughs> fundamental change in the society wasn't really on the cards mm. and therefore they often felt the need to puff up regimes around the world which they really shouldn't have and I think if anything has discredited that project beyond the fact that at this point it does feel like a bit of a relic of the 20th century um, it has been that willingness to make excuses for places um, which were engaging in it's pretty authoritarian things. It's interesting isn't it Venezuela looking around to, to try and solve this where do you think it goes next Dawn obviously they've sort of they're changing its currency there's talk of it turning to cryptocurrency to try and <laughs> save its um, to, to try and save its economy I mean, that is a very 21st century solution. But where do you see it going next? Um, I don't think the measures they're putting in place will actually help hyperinflation. I think that at the moment there's a lot of agitation for the opposition to come in. And the opposition have been uh, quite strong and quite you know, often violent in, in some of it. I think that at the moment there's so little support for the government, there will just be a change of regime and then we'll see what, hap what, what the opposition want to do with the economy at this point. But as we saw with, with, with Weimar Germany, it's very, very difficult to claw your way back after hyperinflation and often very, very you know, extreme and radical elements can, can creep in when the economy is in complete disarray. Yeah, I mean, Tom, it's at a very vulnerable point, mm. isn't it, in its history? I mean, this is one of the, the biggest devaluations of a currency in history. Mm. No, completely. And I think I'm just uh, chiming with what Dawn just said. I think the measures that are being put in place are really not going to make mm. anything very better. I mean, obviously, they're devaluing the currency, which is what they should do. They're introducing this new version of the currency. But they're not doing the things that you would need to do to kind of instill confidence in that new mm. currency, pegging it to this cryptocurrency, which I'm pretty sure that the government came up with in February and everyone thinks is a bit of a sham. I think, again, just points to the fact that we have to lay a lot of the blame here in relation to the Maduro regime and the Venezuelan government. They're the ones who have made these decisions. Yeah, and it, like I said, time and time again, it comes back to socialism, but we've discussed that and the fact that it is the guise of socialism, uh, potentially, but also the regime. It's been likened to a dictatorship. Mm. And foreign investment, a lot of fingers being pointed at that, Dawn. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the Maduro uh, regime has been a complete disaster from the off, mm. you know, and, and it's definitely gotten worse in the past two years. Um, and you know, at the moment, when you look at foreign investment, I think, I think a lot of questions have to be asked about how they're managing that. Um, you know, obviously the sanctions regime hasn't helped, but equally, uh, I think that you know Venezuela are being ruled by an elite who have their investments protected. But you know, you need to look at redistribution and making sure that the ordinary Venezuelans can feed themselves, can get paid, and you know, look at the extreme violence that's happening as a result of the economic unrest well, that always leads to social unrest. Yeah, well, those new measures to try and um, combat the co potential collapse of Venezuela's economy come into effect today. Uh, Tom Slater and Dawn Foster, thank you very much for discussing that. Uh, we were talking about it throughout the day here on Sky News.